Um, it's very nice to see familiar faces again, even though it's just virtually. Um, so what I'll talk about is a flavor violating axions. It's based on uh, three papers uh, <coughs> with uh, Lorenzo Calibi, Florian Gertz, uh, Diego Redigolo, Robert Ziegler, and then Wong uh, also joined, and Martin Kamenich uh, for Empuspelo for, uh, so there's a, of a few per, uh, permutations of the authors. Um, oops. So the, uh, let me start with the motivation. It's really um, sort of bottom up. Uh, <clears throat> is if you think about the N is spontaneously broken global symmetry, um, there would be a pseudo number of Goldstone boson. If this is light enough, it can be a dark matter. And then you wanna ask about what the um, properties of this uh, uh, PNGBs are just completely uh, bottom up. So it will, if you write down the the um, low energy Lagrangian, it will have a shift symmetry, so that the first um, uh, interaction terms will start at dimension five, and there will be uh, the uh, the couplings to GG tilde, FF tilde, and then the couplings to fermions. And here the you know, there's, I will allow for the flavor of the diagonal coupling. So I and J here can be uh, different. So actually I forgot to to ask how long uh, the seminars are usually. Is yeah, it it's one hour? one hour. Mm -hmm. Okay. Basically, yeah, so just, one hour. Okay, so I just say no yep. to time myself. All right. And uh, so the goal of here will be what would be the implications of flavor violating couplings? The flavor diagonals are well explored, but let's ask about what, is there something new that would come from the flavor violating couplings? So there are actually two questions you can ask. Do flavor changing experiments probe interesting parameter space? Is it any, in, you know, are we really probing anything interesting? And how you can improve these search strategies? As a side note here that I have, so I'll uh, use the um, name QCD axion for a PNGB that obtains mass from the QCD anomaly. And then any other on like Flavon, Myron, uh, the PNGB also has an explicit mass term. So it's not gonna be uh, perfect. I mean, there's an exception to every rule, and here axiflavon or flaxion will be a QCD axion, even though it's a, you know, falls into this any other on category. And then furthermore, like all this is then lumped together to call uh, these particles axion-like particles or ARPs. Um, all right, so a little bit more on the motivation. So just to, to see that these flavor violating couplings are very generic now. So all you need is that in the mass spaces, um, the, the, so this would be in the flavor basis, you do all the diagonalization, these are the standard model you cover. So when I go from the interaction basis to the, to the uh, mass basis, of course, I will have this left and right handed rotations acting on the, um, the, let's say the, the, the what would be a, a Peche Queen symmetry. And if this thing is not just a flavor universal, you will end up with flavor violating couplings. No? So if this is not just proportional to one XFL and XFR, if they're not just proportional to one in the generation space, the FIJs, FIFJs will be non-zeros here. The other uh, thing uh, that I want to introduce here is the notation of the um, decay constants that now have indices, flavor indices. So this capital F is just related to the decay constant and divided by these couplings. So if the couplings are small, the capital F will be big. So just meaning that the interactions decouple. No? So if I have C of order one, then capital F and the decay constant of the axion will be uh, more or less the same. Now there's a factor of two that we absorbed here. 
uh, if I drop the V and A uh, indices, then this means that it's um, a geometric sum, all right? Um, all right, so let's look more into the details of the outline. So I'll first- uh, Sorry, so I'll a clarif clarification question. Uh, we're looking yes, at fifth level, right? Okay. okay. Uh, I didn't hear the, the question actually. Clarification, I just wanted to make sure. That's three flavor. Oh yes, so these are quarks, no? This I, J for us would be either standard model quarks or leptons. Fs are standard model fields. Uh, no, 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 oh, I yes. meant like a UDS only. Are you looking at five flavor or SU3? The UDS SU3 or ah, that, that's what I okay. asked. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it will be clear, so I'll, uh, not cover everything that was done in our paper. I will focus on everything except the top. <laughs> all right, but there's also the top in the paper. Okay. So all flavors, yeah. Good point, yes. Uh, all right, so I split it into two parts. So the first one, will look at the uh, bounds from quarks, and then we'll switch on to the leptons. There will be a proposal for a, an upgrade to MEC2 that I'll briefly cover. And then if time permits, I'll also talk about some uh, models of the slept and flavor violating types. All right, so let me start with the quark FCNCs and the bounds you get on the, on the ARPs. So here I will uh, simplify my life and just look at the QCD axiom. No? So it, it will be a QCD axiom that has flavor violating couplings to quarks, but otherwise has all the other ingredients that we love. So it solves the strong CP problem, can be a cold dark matter candidate. And for the phenomenology, uh, the important thing is that it's really just basically massless in the flavor violating transitions. No? So a reminder, so how do you solve a strong CP problem? So if you write down the most general Lagrangian at uh, low energies, there is one uh, renormalizable term that is uh, GG tilde has a theta uh, uh, parameter in front and the physically observable combination, which is the, the theta parameter plus the uh, sum of the, uh, of the phases of the mass matrices for the quarks, so this theta bar is experimentally very small, 10 to the minus 10. So that's the strong CP problem. So why is it so much smaller than the CKM? Uh, the solution uh, from the axion is that theta bar is promoted to a dynamical field. If it only couples to GG tilde, so it has an anomaly with the QCD, then the potential is to a very good approximation symmetric and the minimum will be at theta bar equals zero. All right, so from low energy perspective, this axion will have the interactions that I just introduced. So just a reminder, now this capital F that will start appearing in a few slides is then related to the decay constant. It's a very small mass that comes from the coupling to the QCD. So if this typical scale that we will see is 10 to the 12 for the decay constant, then we're talking about microelectron volts. So effectively massless for the flavor changing transitions. And then a rough range of where this dark matter would be a cold dark matter candidate starts at sort of milli electron volts or so. All right, so uh, let me flash Are you the neglecting the mass term? The, the mass equal to the power uh, yes. I A by F? Yep. So I'm assuming that the mass comes from the anomaly. But uh, um, when I wrote this, sorry, I don't mean that. I, I what I meant was mm -hmm. um, so apart from these, at the same order, uh, you also get the traditional uh, the quark mass terms, right? Um, f bar f uh, and then e to the power i a by f. Uh, let me give you an example, right? If you do a chiral rotation mm -hmm. to rotate a gg dual mm -hmm. into quark, you generate an additional mass operator, right? The mass e to the power i a by f. Mm -hmm. So in the same order, that not that missing? 
no so this this is all uh included in this uh um number i don't know no, i don't no, know maybe no, i'm you're maybe i'm missing yes you're mm -hmm. thinking of the mass of mass of the um uh, axion. axion i'm talking yes. about mm -hmm. the there is an extra operator involving quarks and axion yes uh, this comes as uh, so the mass terms for the quarks are um, you know f bar l f bar r f bar l, l f r right yes, times so m uh, there you get an e to the power mean... i a by f ah okay 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 Perfect. but yeah i see yeah got it okay so all I wanted to say is that unless you have a uh, no, 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 significant... that's, not, that's not it. That's not it. Sorry. It's okay, an, maybe it, I'm, maybe it's I'm an, missing what you want to tell me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an M times e to the power I A by F. It's not the D mm -hmm. mu A term. Yeah. So I'm okay. Here we go. So I'm assuming that I have a PNGB. So the, the, the are derivative couplings. Now you can do a field redefinition. Mm -hmm. and move this into the um so you can okay. rewrite this as the um as the scalar and pseudoscalar couplings okay. and this okay. is what we do in the end okay but it, um you know you can do a spurious analysis in either way okay so you have eliminated mm -hmm. the mass operator in writing absorb the coefficient into the gg dual and the uh, and the dim ua piece Okay, I'm happy. Okay, all right. All right, so uh, I'll flash the bounds and then I'll go uh, quickly over where they come from. Uh, I think here what you really wanna um, sort of um, zoom in now is that A, the bounds are quite severe, no? So this is all, a, it's all on the capital Fs, no? So if you want to, translate this on into the decay constant, the axiom decay constant, then assume, you know, assuming that the CSD coupling is order one, this is F, small f. You are, we are at 10 to the 12 with K to pi, and uh, the uh, this is the dark shaded regions. So the uh, light shaded parts are the prospects for, um, what you can do with experimental improvements. So even on the log scale, you now there can be huge improvements uh, expected. And uh, there are of course many transitions that probe different couplings. You know? So S to D, C to U, B to D, B to S. And I also plotted here where the flavor diagonal uh, uh, couplings would be. So that would be uh, let's say a typical coupling to photon bound. There's caveats here now to, to uh, nucleon and the electron. And now let's go a bit further into the details of this. So where did these bounds come from? So there, uh, all of them use this flavor uh, violating couplings between quarks and the axion. So you could have for instance, a two body meson decay. So first heavier meson decays to a lighter one, plus an axion. Axion will look like a missing energy in the, in the uh, experiment. So you can do K to pi A, B to K, A, B to pi A. Um, and, uh, you know, you arrive to a bunch of uh, constraints uh, that I've shown in, in pictorially before, all right? So there's a few um, details here. For instance, the B to K A searches or B to pi A searches were not done. So what you can do is you can, you need to recast the um, measurements of the standard model or search for a standard model transition, which is B to K in Unibar. So in here, there is a zero mass bin that sometimes was cut out Unfortunately, uh, in the most uh, so well cut out is been so the the best measurements that you could do don't even include this uh, bins. So that's where these huge jumps in sensitivity are possible in some modes, for instance, B to row A, because um, uh, you would just have uh, you would not throw out uh, the 
the, the data. Uh, for instance, d to pi a, similarly, you need to recast this uh, chain, d to tau pi nu bar nu. So it's, this is absolutely not um, uh, optimized for a two-body decay search, even though it gives reasonable limit. Then there's, um, instead of having pseudo-scalar to pseudo-scalar, you can have pseudo-scalar to a vector transition, uh, then you're in, sensitive instead of the vector, you're sensitive to the axial couplings. Now, the interesting thing is that the, uh, the two-body hyperon decays also are giving you quite an, a nice sensitivity. So these bold numbers are uh, where you have the best bounds on a particular coupling out of all the modes that, were, um, that you can consider. And you see that already now, for instance, this cascade to sigma a for the axial, that's where the best bound comes from. Uh, and in the future, it will come from lambda to na search, well, the projection at least. Um, then there's also three body decays that we uh, looked and you could also use this three body case in BD case uh, to search for these modes, even in LHCB potentially. All right, so then there are other constraints. Ah, there is a question. Yeah, quick question. So uh, where do the supernova constraints come from? Uh, ah, yeah, so I'll have it in one slide, but okay. it comes from the lambda to NA decay. I, I won't say really much more, but that's where it comes from, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, all right, so we also looked at the, into the other constraints, for instance, um, you could induce the meson mixing. So you have uh, uh, one flavor of quarks, another flavor of quarks, and then you emit an axion in between. And, uh, you know, luckily the k and the B quarks are in the opposite spectrum. So k are light enough that you can use chi PT. Uh, B quarks are heavy enough that you can use operator product expansion. And then we also apply the same for the DD bar mixing. The benefit is that now, um, if you if this IP was so if our axiom was an IP, so a heavier guy, that it could decay into in the detector, uh, then these bounds don't depend on what the IP decays to whether it decays or not. Uh, the that's the plus. The minus, the negative side is that the bounds are inherently UV sensitive because. Um, at the same order, so this comes as one over F squared, so it's dimension six, and then there would be a dimension six new physics operators that you don't include. Um, all right, so how did this look like? No, so the chi PT, uh, we did uh, uh, the NLO analysis so that we have both uh, vector and axial currents. Um, so let's say this one here is, uh, what we're correcting the five over six that you would have in vacuum insertion approximation that was used before. So numerically not so important, but maybe just conceptually. Uh, and then uh, this, there are these unknown um, coefficients that you don't know that come at an NLO, uh, uh, that are entering at NLO. So this low energy coefficients are the chi PT coefficients for a chi PT with a light axion. For the vectors, it already starts at, uh, there's no leading order piece. It only starts at the, at the, um, the one loop order. And there, uh, this uh, unknown low energy coefficients are um, you know, increasing the errors on the prediction. All right, and just highlighting now that the best bound comes from KK bar mixing from epsilon K, however, there's this wrinkle that there is also a um, dimension six contribution from coming from the U physics where you don't have an axiom propagating, but it's just a, this thing would be shrunk to a point and it would come parametrically at the same order. The heavy meson mixing is um, just an expansion in one over the mass of the, of the B meson. Um, and it would be important. So DD bar mixing would give uh, gives good bounds, um, but 
it does come with again the same problem not that it's UV sensitive and now I had a question about the supernova bounds so pictorially what I just said no is that there is uh, we have a population of uh, lambda uh, hyperons inside the neutron star of course it's subdominant but um, it's big enough that it can efficiently cool the proton neutron star through this decay. So lambda to a neutron and an axion. Now this, uh, the emission rate has several suppression factors. So at, um, if you had uh, T equals zero, no, then all the Fermi level energies would be equally populated and then lambda to NA decays would not be possible. So that's this uh, suppression factor, this exponential suppression factor. So if T goes to zero, this thing completely blows up. Uh, even so, no, this, um, so of course the temperature in the proton neutron star are not zero, they're 30 MeV or so. Uh, so the bound that I showed was shown for 30 MeV. There's, of course, you see exponential dependence on the properties here. Um, so this gives you this bounds of 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 GeV um, were uh, on the axial and vector couplings. Is there a question? Yes, yeah, a small comment. So I would have thought that the, the Primorkov process inside the supernova would perhaps be the dominant mm -hmm. process to create axions, but uh, this is the major one, is it? Lambda to it. I would have thought there are yeah, so... photons around. So. Yeah, yeah, so of course, okay, so I should say no, you only switch on the SD coupling. No, okay, so that, that's can, that's where the bound came you from. Neglect the mm -hmm. process. And there is no primacol process for the SD coupling, yeah, yeah of course not. Yeah, yeah. uh, but it, yeah, I, I'll I can comment on this again now when we'll have a few couplings on the same plot, sure, and uh, yeah, all right. So um, I think it's can here, I, no? Can I ask a slightly mm -hmm. unrelated question, but uh, it concerns something in the previous slide. Um, so this one? The, uh, yeah. So or any of the before any of the calculation you did for mm -hmm. this cannot cannot bar. Uh, so you mm -hmm. uh, the a mass right that comes uh, certain effect, right? Mass of a. Mm -hmm. The uh, mass of a there is a QCD generated mass, right? And there, mm -hmm. I mean that that comes really when you um, just integrate out neglecting everything else. Uh, but there is also a piece because of um, you are taking a most general potential, right? Uh, interactions, mm -hmm. right? So that allows mm -hmm. uh, a to mix with eta prime, mm -hmm. you know, and. Um, and so that involves uh, uh, a contribution to A couplings with the rest of them, uh, rest mm -hmm. of the meson sector, because eta prime mixes with A, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that changes the mass of A a bit, and that more importantly changes the uh, the you know the the parameters uh, that comes into effect. So the question yeah. was, uh, did mm -hmm. when you try to fit together, did you include the eta prime mixing? as well yeah mm -hmm. so um so the way uh, the so the eta prime now of course it's uh, above the cut of a chi pt uh yes so eta right. prime is yeah exactly so uh, you're uh, right but but the light it still leaves the right yeah. degree of freedom because yeah, the yeah, thing yeah. at eta primes mm -hmm. mass scale mm -hmm. the light degree of freedom is there but that light degree of freedom is altered it's it's different yeah. than so the, the, yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, it's it's fine. Uh, uh, so the way it enters now is as counter terms. So this will be at p to the four. So eta prime will enter to this p to the four terms, and they will it will be part of this alpha zero to alpha one uh, pieces here. Okay, so this is just a counter term that you don't know, but it's um, it it does come at p to the four. And the reason is exactly because the mass of eta prime is I see. much yeah. bigger than, yeah. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe uh, since I'm back to this, uh, so um, 
you know, this, this equations in principle, you can use also um, if you don't really have a QCD axiom, no? it, it, as long as you have uh, the same couplings, but masses yeah, are much absolutely smaller. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah so absolutely. Right. Uh, but the, but you can't uh, you can't decouple eta prime from it. But you're right. If it comes in a higher yeah. order effect, it looks yeah, like. it comes in P yeah. to the four. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I was here. Ah, yeah. So we were uh, sort of looking at these uh, bounds, no. And uh, I think I, one question I had was uh, that I received was about the supernova. So for instance, if you look at the the diagonal piece, which is the Primakov uh, guy, no? uh, okay, it's in the same ballpark if you switch S and S, S to decoupling, but uh, slightly more stringent. Um, there's also the the bound on the coupling to the electrons. So these are all just switching one at a time, no? all these bounds that are shown. Uh, the main is coming from the wide work cooling, the main constraint. Um, and then uh, what they had here now was just the, 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 uh, the bound from a cast, which is uh, over many uh, uh, ARP, ARP masses, uh, is this F gamma that I'm showing, an I arc, so is this dashed line. So you see that there are um, flavor changing neutral current transitions are kind of probing the same parameter space. Of course, there is an assumption here now or the dependence on what exactly the flavor structure is. So how big this uh, flavor of diagonal couplings are. So in order to address that, let me just do an explicit model, which is the oxy flavon. All right, so for this, I, I need to step back and um, review uh, sort of one um, approach to solving the standard model uh, um, flavor puzzle, which is why do we have uh, such hierarchies between quark masses, what is mostly meant for the quark masses, and uh, the pattern of the mixing angles. So the frog and Nissen mechanism does the following, no? so you assume that there's a horizontal U1 charge. This would be the standard model fields that are at the, the end of these chains. They carry some horizontal charge. And then in order to couple the standard model fermions that have now different uh, horizontal charges, you have to go through a step of vector-like fermions that either couple to a flavon, this capital phi, or they couple to a Higgs. Now somewhere there's a Higgs, a standard model Higgs uh, that will break the electric symmetry, right? So the longer this chain, the bigger the suppression. If the Flavon wave over the mass of the, uh, the vector-like fermions is a small number, let's say 0.2. So X is this difference of the charges. So the difference of the charges is big, a long chain, this would be a big suppression. All right, so what is uh, oxyflavon? Well, if you look at this mechanism, there's a nice observation that you already have all the ingredients for the oxygen mechanism. No? So what are they? I need the PQ symmetry, a global one that is spontaneously broken. The Goldstone boson would be the axion and this global symmetry need to be anomalous under QCD. Now this flavor symmetry that I just introduced, the U1, satisfies both. No? It's spontaneously broken and has anomaly under the QCD. So the oxyflavon is just saying that this PQ symmetry is the Frogan Nielsen U1 horizontal. And the phase of the flavon field is the, the QCD axiom. All right. So what this then leads to is A, first you will introduce flavor violating couplings to fermions, well, the ones that I was bounding. It predicts up to order one factors what the size of this coupling in is just gonna be a geometric mean of the, uh, given by the geometric mean of the standard model quark masses or the standard model Yukawas. Um, and uh, in addition, it also predicts the flavor diagonal couplings. So now we can put everything on one slide and compare really um, all the flavor diagonal and flavor violating couplings. So what's plotted here is there's, uh, this is the mass of A. 
so the axial mass. Uh, this is in the usual plot where we have the coupling to the photons of the axion. Um, up here is the mass of A was converted to the uh, decay constant. And then the decay constant was converted to the theta that you need in the early universe to get the dark matter mass. Uh, so the dark matter relic abundance. So roughly here, okay, I, I took it, uh, I took the window a bit further up, but this is the largest theta roughly that you would have. In this window, roughly, not speaking, is where you would have a dark matter uh, axion. Axion is a dark matter. Uh, also depends on the details of, of what happened at the early universe. The grayed out area are different constraints on the, on the um, flavor diagonal couplings. And uh, the band here, the brown band is the oxyflavon band and this yellow band is um, a region of um, some KSVC, DFSC uh, models. So some variation of, of the usual QCD axion models. The solid blue line is where the constraints on K to pi A were, where, you know, this is now four years plus ago. Um, and the dashed line was the predicted NA62. So the bound is slightly to the left now, uh, presently. All right, so what this highlights is that, you know, this flavor changing ultracurrents actually do really probe something interesting. All right, so now I will switch to leptons. Um, so here I will do a slightly different take on, on uh, the whole story because I will allow uh, for the mass to be uh, not fixed by the QCD anomaly. I will assume ARPs and then I will vary the, so we'll vary these ARP masses switching on the flavor violating couplings. And here the, I'd say the main sort of interest is that we have these facilities, MEG2, MU3, MU23E, MU2E that are coming online and they will have 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 17 muons delivered. The bounds on the couplings of the IPS to, uh, so flavor writing couplings to, uh, to muons are uh, coming from much smaller data sets, no? 10 to the seven uh, from UDD et al in 86. And then there's another analysis with 10 to the eight or another search from twist in 2015. So what would this great increase bias? So the upshot is, um, this is, a, a, so I'm showing uh, constraints in the plot of the uh, ARP mass um, versus the decay constant, keeping all, the, so taking all the couplings to leptons to be one, so flavor violating flavor diagonal. And um, so this great stuff is excluded. There are, uh, the solid lines are also exclusions. You did do it all, I just mentioned, there are three lines, we'll try to understand them. If you just look at this green solid line, the jump with MEG2 forward that I will talk about uh, is sort of an order of magnitude. And now let me explain now what's in all these plots. All right. So, uh, so MEG2 forward, uh, oh, I think I skipped one, all right. Yeah. So there are sort of two types of searches that you can uh, perform or have been performed. In both cases, you're looking at a two body decay. So if you are, have a muon that decays at rest, you are searching for a positron line so at the uh, energy that is given by the mass of the arc. No? So if this is massless, then the line will just be at half the mass of the muon. So that's what's plotted here now is that the line would be here. No? That's where the line would be at one. XA is this relative fraction compared to the half of mass uh, of the muon. So one 
means the energy of the positron is half of the muon mass. So the line would be here for a massless guy. If it's heavier, it would be somewhere, uh, somewhere uh, in this uh, let's say in this uh, region. Now the first thing you can do is you can try to suppress the standard model background. So there is a standard model decay, which is three body mu to e nu nu bar. So you have a distribution. However, if it's coming from polarized muons like this, so I have a polarized muon that has stopped and you look at the decays that are in the opposite direction of the muon polarization. So that's this angle theta that is varied on the plot on the right. So cosine theta equal one is the solid line, cosine theta equal 0.8 is this dashed and 0.6 is this dotted line. You see that if you focus in the forward region, so theta E equals zero, then the standard model will be suppressed. <clears throat> so that's one strategy. You polarize muons, you stop them, and you look in the forward region. This is what was done in 1986. So you suppress the standard model, which is great. Uh, the um, flip side is that you're only sensitive to the right-handed arps. No? Light-handed arp couplings will have the same property. So you also suppressed the decays that you're searching for. So only right-handed guys you're sensitive to. The other strategy is that you don't suppress the standard model. You go for the full uh, distributions. And um, so take more, uh, just take more data then you're also sensitive to light left-handed art. So that's the twist in 2015, all right? So now what we're proposing is that, um, so MEC2 already has uh, decently polarized uh, muons. They stop them. Uh, and then what we're saying is that you could uh, repurpose this uh, MEC2 setup. So after the MEC2, uh, run so the search for uh, uh, mu to e gamma is done. Uh, you could uh, just put um, a calorimeter downstream. Uh, you would need to reconfigure the magnetic field to do this. So there were two lines that I will show is that you don't have any focusing, so no magnetic field or a real, more realistic one where you arrange the magnetic field such that you get more positrons, you capture more positrons, which is F of 100, is what was achieved by the D and 86. So it's another picture now. So there is already um, in place a counter here that is um, used for calibration. So the idea is just to replace this with a, a new calorimeter and then reconfigure this whole magnetic uh, field configuration. Uh, so this is the interaction point. All right. So the interesting thing is that you can reach nice sensitivity on already if you run for two weeks. So that's what I've been plotting. No? So these lines here no? are after two weeks of running of MEC2 forward and the different uh, different, um, um, so there's the MEC2 forward where it says F equal one. No? This is this um, brown line. If you have a focusing, it's the orange line and you wanna compare with the solid line from your DDO. Um, this is for um, switching on both left and right-handed couplings. Then there are two more lines in your DDO. This is if you only have left-handed couplings and only right-handed couplings is this dashed line. Uh, so you wanna compare solid to solid. Um, twist, it's similar, but uh, without polarized muons. So it's less sensitive and it's the same story, you know? So it's um, left, so both and then the um, left-handed and right-handed. 
Now, I'll just quickly say a few words about the mu 3 e that is also a projected uh, line. So what is this? There is a um, mu 3 e experiment can, uh, could also search for mu 2 e decays, mu 2 e x decays, mu 2 e a. So there would be, you would search for a line on a Michel spectrum, right? Uh, and they have to do uh, a modified uh, analysis. So it's sort of online event reconstruction uh, where you don't ask all the information that you possibly can. So that's this short tracks terminology. And uh, doing this, you would be better than MEC2 forward by a factor of uh, a few. So the timeline, no, just that we know, uh, so that was the timeline for MEC2 shifted a bit. So there's a gap here now where you could do a MEC2 forward. And then mu23e is supposed to be staggered, but it's probably going to be also delayed because the same people that are doing MEC2 are also doing mu23e more or less. Um, there's also tau decays that you can search for. This would be a Bell, uh, Bell 2 prospect. So the the I just uh, highlight maybe the difficulty now is the fact that now we have a lot of missing energy. There's a tau's on one side have a neutrino, and you also have your axion. Um, so it's not easy to reconstruct the the tau rest frames. Uh, the bounds are um, are coming from a very old experiment. So it's from ninety five. There, is, there was no searches done at Bell or Babar, just um, prospects. Um, so, okay. Um, okay, so we, we also rescaled this astrophysics bounds. Um, so these, were, these are these great regions. Maybe I'll just skip the details here. Um, the one thing that is interesting and I advertised a bit is that, you know, these ARPs can be dark matter just because the masses are so low and the, uh, if the masses are low enough, because we're going, the decays would go through the mention five couplings. So let's say A to gamma gamma. If this um, decay constant is 10 to the 10 GV or so, uh, what would it mean that it can be a dark matter candidate? Well, first thing you need to do now is at least it should not decay during the lifetime of the universe. So just demanding that the decay time is longer than the lifetime of the universe. Then uh, you're kind of okay if the masses are below 10 kV or so. No? So the, you will not decay to two photons before the lifetime of the universe, if you are in less than a KV regime. Now there are other uh, constraints. Of course, now you look at the sky. Um, I think I have a slide now. So they would just look at the uh, the uh, the uh, the annihilations of the photons, uh, so of the axions. Uh, sorry, the decays of the axions. You can see. Uh, ambient light that would come to us. So that's this excluded region. This uh, dash line excludes the region where the ARP would decay. And then uh, these are different experiments. So the lines here are the lepton flavor violating uh, decay uh, searches. No? So FCNC searches, you did DO et al. Uh, MEC2 forward with out focusing, with focusing and mu23e. Uh, the dotted lines are the two um, uh, to guide your eye toward where you can have um, a relic abundance with a very simple uh, mechanism. So just the oscillations with either uh, uh, temperature dependent masses. So that would be uh, sort of a QCD like behavior for the art mass or a fixed mass. Uh, so just uh, um, an explicit breaking. Mm -hmm. uh, the dotted lines are not actually clearly visible on at least on my monitor. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's very good. Absolutely. I'll, I'll be happy to. So let me annotate. 
Yeah, there, there I, I agree, you know. So this is this line. Sorry. Very good. That's the, if you uh, assume that it has a, um, a temperature dependent, this is exactly the same as you would have with the QCD. And if you just plug in a mass, which is fixed, now you just take this mass and you don't scale it with temperature. You would get this line. Yeah, and, you know, there's an assumption of what the theta zero is, and that's just the simplest, <laughs> you know, it's just the, the oscillating field. Yes. Hi, uh, in a different context, when people talk about interferometry experiments to look for axion, which region of parameter space in this plot they actually look for? It is basically the lower left corner? The, ooh, or I, upper right? I think upper I missed, left. I, I think I missed the, 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 the best part, which is the beginning. Uh, uh, people talk about in, interferometry experiments, right? I mean, tabletop interferometry experiments. Mm -hmm. Look for axion. Now, in, in this region of parameter space, uh, is it, is, I mean, does it fall in this region? It's outside this region of parameter space they look for. I mean, they... Yeah, so you have a bunch of them, like, um, so ADMX, for instance, now is here, no? So that's the ADMX, I don't know if it's visible. This is ADMX, quarks. Um, Madam, I mean, there, you have a bunch of the proposed stuff that is uh, um, Mad Max, for instance, is here now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw this visible. And what is the timeline of those experiments? Ah, they have different timelines. So I, I would know for all of them. Um, but it's like yeah. five years or something like that? or Maybe. Yeah, I mean, many of the things uh, this, um, you know, are happening now. So this is, for instance, um, I don't know, Abracadabra just came out with their bounds, um, which are not here, no, because this was before. So uh, it's different experiments are in different stages. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, fine. Yeah. Okay. okay, please go ahead. I mean, just start. Sure, yeah. It's good, it's good. Uh, all right, so I think maybe I have uh, just, uh, let's say, three minutes left. So there is a, um, quite a few slides that uh, I had if I uh, were, let's say, more uh, quick than I thought. So, so what uh, I'll so do you, now... you have mm -hmm. uh, about eight, uh, roughly 10 minutes if you want. So. Ah, so you, you want me to go all the way. Okay, that's good. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'll, I'll then um, go over a few examples of this lepton flavor violating art models. No? So we'll see how realistic it is. So um, the examples here will be um, chosen such that you will have lepton flavor violating uh, couplings, but uh, the um, quark uh, flavor violation will be suppressed for different reasons. Okay, so I'll have lepton flavor violating, oops, lepton fly, flavor relating uh, QCD axion, oxyflavon, uh, leptonic uh, famulon, and then the myron. Uh, so let me start with this um, the QCD axion. So here, uh, the uh, so so this is probably the most ad hoc out of these four is the, um, the, the reason why you have uh, lepton flavor violation, uh, but no, uh, no quark flavor violation is because you just assume that the uh, PQ charges are universal in the quark sector. Right? So there will be no uh, flavor violation there but non-universal in the leptonic sector. And the model itself is a very simple extension of the DFSZ one. So you have a, exactly the same field content, two Higgs doublet model plus a singlet, except that these charge assignments are uh, slightly different and they are um, uh, flavor non-universal. No? I mean, it's a very, very small change. Uh, so just, you know, like with, um, so there are two Higgses in there and the Yukavas to H1 and H2 no, are, uh, have the zeros where the uh, couplings are forbidden. No? And then there would, the, the boxes tell you the 
sizes of the Yukawas, no? The size of the boxes is not fixed by the symmetry, no? This is that hog part, right? So you just put some sizes for the down and up quarks, they're just whatever they are, but they diagonalize uh, in the same, uh, uh, so that, that, you know, this would be a diagonalization, we give you the down and up quark masses, the diagonalization of Ye, Ye prime gives you the leptonic masses, and the organization matrices will enter the, uh, will then govern the couplings to the axiom, all right? So, so, so. Uh, Sorry, a cl clarification. Mm -hmm. um, so in your last transparency, when you say X and X, do you mean order off or do you actually mean one, one? No, 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 this, are, this is one. No? I mean, XS is the, the PQ charge of the S and then H2 mm -hmm. and H1 have this, uh, these charges, and then I didn't tell you what the charges are for the flare, for the fermions, it would be too much, no? Yeah. So okay. I'm, I'm pictorially showing. <laughs> so, all right. But the important thing is now that you see that, uh, you know, I mean, visually you see that the couplings are not um, yeah. universal, no? These yeah, zeros yeah. are forbidden from by the charges. Yeah. While for quarks, nothing is forbidden. Okay. Right. Um, then, of course, you know, there are still um, freedoms, what you choose for the Yukawas, that's where this assumption of what this uh, uh, but, but on, are on this, comes. On ah. this topic, right, I mean, you're, I mean, it is complete, apart from zeros, it's completely independent spurions, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so the um, that's what I ask is that when you say the for example the x x x x all components to say that it's you know it uh, um, I mean what does it violate I mean does it violate uh, SO three squared to nothing or uh, I mean one 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 is a very special structure no mm. yeah that's what I was going to say oh there is. Uh, I think maybe I'm not sure what exactly you're asking me, uh, but when you say uh, X and X, do they mean of the order one, all of them or? Ah, this X is, sorry, I didn't understand. I thought it was excess. Yeah. So these guys, no, I mean, I mean so these guys here. No? Yes, this, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, ah, that's, that's good. This maybe flew uh, by. So the, the size of the box, no? Yes. Tells me the value ah. of x, no, in some logarithmic way, no. So this small box is uh, much, much smaller than x. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I missed the, I missed the size right. thingy. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and this. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, two eigenvalues would have been zero anyway. So it's exactly not the same. that that that's the reason I was confused. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you know, I mean, the, the, the difference in the sizes is completely ad hoc, no? <clears throat> There's no, there is no reason why, no? Yeah. In this model, it's just yeah, yeah. by hand. Yeah, it, it's just a texture. I mean, that's it. Yeah, yeah it's, you get the texture, but not what the X's are. That's right, yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Um, then, um, yeah, so, <clears throat> so there's still some, there's still some remaining assumptions that you have freedom about uh, what, how big the one, two, one, three, and so on mixings are in the leptonic sector. Uh, so there are, for instance, uh, two choices where we have a large V plus A mixing or V minus A mixing. It will lead to large um, right-handed couplings to the, to the axion or large left-handed couplings to the Axion, so right handed is the left one, left handed is uh, uh, the right one. And uh, so this is in the MA versus the coupling to the photons uh, plot. And you want to look at these vertical lines here. No? So this is everything to the right is excluded um, from the, uh, in this case, the, uh, the white, white world cooling. The mu to e present searches are these dotted lines here. Meg to forward would be this dotted line here. And then mu to 3e is uh, also this dotted line. Now you want to contrast this with the one on the right, 
where MEC2 forward line disappears and mu 2 e present is also much worse, has to do with this fact that you only have left-handed couplings. As I said, the, these experiments are not sensitive uh, as well to the left-handed couplings. All right, so um, I think, let me just um, highlight, so I'll, I'll be very brief on the other three, no? So what you can do is you can now modify this, um, you know, structure by doing the following. So if instead of uh, having um, the, um, this flavor structure just be um, coming from uh, nowhere, uh, you can have a, really a flavor model. So for instance, if you take this to be not the, uh, U1 horizontal, but SU2 cross U1 flavor group. Uh, this will give rise to a suppression of the K2 pi A versus mu2 EA. I mean, the reason is that the mixings are much larger in, in leptons than they are in the in the uh, uh, with quarks, and the SU2 structure requires you to go through the third generation. Right. So K2 pi A is now naturally suppressed. You have a model for really for the for the for the masses and the observation mode would be mu to ea no? in this case oops second yeah a is the same uh, plot so uh, it's not really so important uh <clears throat> you can still do i mean there's another example where we have a u1 frog at nielsen but you would have a different u1 for instance for uh, leptons than you have for the quarks then again, you can suppress the, the quark FC and Cs, and this, okay, we skip. And then finally, the myron, uh, where the PNGB has nothing to do with uh, uh, axion, no, nothing with a CP, uh, strong CP problem. Uh, it's just a PNGB due to spontaneously broken lepton number. Uh, if you do this low energy CISO type, uh, models, then uh, you can have really large enough couplings to uh, leptons that you could be observing uh, a myron in the transitions. No? So this would be, for instance, <clears throat> mu to 3 e uh, line uh, versus all the other constraints that are present. All right, so I rushed a bit over the, the last three models, but I hope I um, convey that these FCNCs are uh, really a powerful tool to search for axion-like particles. I uh, covered uh, a number of transitions. There's, uh, I think one um, thing that came out of uh, this exercise is that uh, quite a number of transitions were not really included in the experimental analysis, but can be quite powerful. Uh, so dedicated uh, searches there would be, uh, I mean, can can uh, reap benefits. And then I advocated for this MEC2 forward phase of the MEC2 experiment, where you can have a reach which is well above the previous experiments and above the astrophysics bounds. Uh, is it possible that Higgs can decay to two axioms? through a triangle loop, top quad loop, because axion has a strong coupling with the top quad, according to the way you, you projected the textures. Yeah. So it didn't have any yes. indication. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this, you would be in a completely different regime. No? So it, yeah. um, because F, no, so, uh, go back. Um, yeah, okay, this is good enough, no? Um, or maybe. Uh, it's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's fine. No, I mean, like, you see, we're sort of at 10 to the 10 GV, no? If you want to see something uh, with Higgs going to two Alps, you should be somewhere down here, no? Okay, it's not the Myron, but you know, you know what I'm saying, no? It's all these plots that they had. Maybe I should go to the real uh, plots. So for instance, if I go, uh, it's a good, 
Okay, let's look at this one. Maybe this is good. It's not, it's not in the F plane, but it's well below, no? Well below. You want to have uh, F, which is at uh, TV, or less. If you want mm -hmm. to see Higgs to AA. Uh, does it, but it's not otherwise, is it ruled out otherwise? I mean, how does the plot, I mean, how to interpret this plot then? I mean, if you extend mm -hmm. it below. Yeah. So uh, that's not my work, no? So the best yeah. place would be, to, yeah. <laughs> I mean, people have, have looked at uh, IAPSET colliders and at, in different masses you are, as, I mean, depends on the now um, the uh, decay channels also, because mm -hmm. um, if your IAP is heavy enough, it will decay inside, it will depend on the assumed um ad, i mean now you see that it's not just good enough to to say what the production mechanism is you also need to know what the decay uh, channels are and that depends on the the details of the model and this was explored um let's say, I see. okay Robert and company had uh, done this uh, ridiculo the company okay um yeah so i can give you a very short answer unfortunately but otherwise, it's you know if you, if it's the case to two photons, that's Higgs to pseudo to to pseudo scalars. No? As a search. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? There were quite a few already in the talk. Uh, Okay, so it seems like there are no further questions. So then let's thank the speaker. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Zoo. Yeah. All right. Great.